How many have already heard from the Lord this morning? And the rest of you, listen up. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Fantastic. It's always good to be here with you all. We're uh, getting, back, getting back into our study of 1 Peter. We're in chapter 4, the latter few verses, seven or eight verses there. And I'm not going to go into a ton of review this morning about this letter and why Peter wrote it to these Christians who were running for their lives, scattered all over the place. Uh, check out the messages, the past messages online on our website to get caught up there. Um, main thought of this letter is to encourage the saints, to give them hope, to build them up. They're kind of in a situation, a circumstance that's dire, that's tough, being persecuted, being chased. They're running for their lives because they've associated with Jesus Christ. Trials are a part of life, aren't they? How many are being chased because of their faith? Not too many of us, but yet life is full of trials, isn't it? And sufferings, and so we can relate to this letter, and Peter writes this to us. God's word is for us today, so we're going to tap into these last few verses of chapter 4. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there. I'm not going to read that portion this morning. My daughter asked me, Dad, you're going to go through all this this morning? <laughs> There's seven points here. We're going to do this quickly and ask God to touch us. Let's pray again. Invite the Lord into our life, into our time again freshly. Father, thank you for being here. Thank you for being our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity, the freedom that we have in this country to meet, to come together without somebody busting the door down, without interruption. And Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that it has. Thank you for the letter, the instruction you wrote to us, the love letter, so to speak. And I just pray, just as your word has power and, and authority and purpose and effect, Lord, I pray that that happened this morning. Touch us, Lord, wherever we're at. Whatever we're struggling with, whatever our head is right now, Lord, bring us back to center here. And so minister, Father, as only you can do fully to each of us. Father, have little conversations with each of us. You're able to do that because of who you are. And I just ask God always for your grace. I ask for your input. I ask for your wisdom, your discernment as I share your word that if I use what you've taught me this week to encourage the saints to build up the body of Christ. And we give you the next few minutes, Lord. Undivided attention, Lord. Help us to keep our attention here in Jesus' name. Amen. How many would say that suffering and pain get your attention? Gets my attention. The past couple of weeks, I've had a pain right here. <laughs> and it's gotten my attention. There's been some activities that have limited, I've been limited in doing because of this pain right here. It's got my attention. And life does that, doesn't it? There are certain things in our lives that are happening that God is using to get our attention. And oftentimes it's suffering, it's pain, it's trials, it's issues. And I don't know about you, but there are some people out there that want to learn it the hard way. You ever know people like that? The answer is over here, but they've decided to do it the hard way. Maybe all of us can relate to that at some point in our life. And Peter addresses that. And suffering and pain always refines us. 
always points to something. It is used by God to test us in Zechariah, the Old Testament book, the one between Zephaniah and something else. (laughs) You can look it up. Chapter 13, verse 9 says it this way, I will bring them into the fire. He's speaking of the church. I will bring them into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. And they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. That's part of God's package. There are no shortcuts in the Christian life. (laughs) There are no shortcuts there and I don't know what you're suffering through. I don't know what trials, what things that are before you that you're experiencing. And maybe these stats will encourage you this morning. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, you are more blessed than the six million people who will not survive this week. If you have never experienced the danger of battle, the loneliness of imprisonment, the agony of torture, or the pangs of starvation, you are ahead of 500 million people in the world. If you can attend church without fear of harassment, arrest, torture, or death, you are more blessed than three billion people in the world. If you have food in the refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the world. If you have money in the bank, in your wallet, spare change in your cup holder, in your car, you are among the top 8% of the world's wealthy. Wow. A little little perspective there. Are you really suffering? Are you really in trial? And these verses we're going to look at this morning give us some insights on how to respond, how, how, how to look at suffering, trials, things in our life, and I have seven points here, seven, there are eight verses, I've got seven points for us to look at this morning. How are we to look, how are we to respond to suffering? God brings it into our life, allows it, how how are we to look at it? And the first one I have is don't be surprised. (laughs) Don't be surprised at it, like, wow, where did that, how how did that happen? Don't don't be surprised. Dear friends, do not be surprised, Peter says, at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. How many find it strange still to this day when trials happen? How did, I I didn't think that should ever happen. This is strange. Do, Do not be surprised, Peter's saying. It's a part of life. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, all who desire to live godly in Christ, Jesus will be persecuted. We'll have some trials. We'll have issues in their life. It's, It's a part of life, right? How many have not had something (laughs) <laughs> good, good, all right, we all understand that's part of it. It's a part of proclaiming Jesus Christ, of associating with him. The, really, the surprise should be if it isn't happening to you. That, that's what we should be surprised about. John 15, 19 says this, if you belong to the world... It would love you as as its own, as it is you do not belong to the world. If you're saved, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, Peter says that we're to be strangers in this world. We're not of this world. It's not our place, but I have chosen you out of the world. 
That is why the world hates you. How many have suffered for knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior? R really suffered. Now, there's variances of that, isn't there? I had lunch this past week with Doug Brown, who works with uh, limited access countries. If you know what that means, it, it means that we can't just go in there and share the gospel. It's against the law in these countries. And he is aware, he has uh, connections with people who are in prison because of their faith, because of their identification with Jesus Christ. A good friend of his, a pastor, is in the United States right now on political and religious asylum. He's being protected because there's a bounty on his head. Suffering for Jesus Christ. Is that happening to you? If we are walking and talking little Christ's, being like Christ, persecution is going to be there. It may not be to the degree I just explained to you, but it could be in other degrees, which we'll get to here in a minute. There's a sowing and reaping is what the Bible, I don't know, sometimes I look at the Bible, there's a sowing. If, if you sow this, if you act like this, these certain things are going to happen. That happens in life, doesn't it? But if you act like this in a negative way, there are certain repercussions or certain reaping. And so the idea is that if you are associating yourself with Christ, there's going to be some repercussions, some pushback. I like what John Wesley's attitude was. He was riding along a road one day when it dawned on him that three whole days had passed and no one had thrown a brick at him. Or an egg. Three days had passed. And he was alarmed, and so he stopped his horse, it says in this story, and said to himself, Can it be that I have sinned and backslidden? <laughs> that, that I'm not being effective for God? Could, could it be that I'm not living for Jesus Christ? I'm, that I'm not associating myself with Jesus Christ? Is, is, is that what's happened? Is that why I'm not being pursued, persecuted? Stepping off his horse, he went down to his knees, began interceding with God. God, show me. Show me where I've missed the mark, where I've gotten lazy. God, just show me. And evidently in the bushes nearby, a... Wrangler, uh, one who was not interested in what John had to say. Here's what he's praying, and he says, I'll fix that guy. <laughs> and so he ends up throwing rocks at him. And John Wesley is going, yes! <laughs> I'm back in the will of God. Do, do, do we think like that? Is, that? is that in our thinking, in our arsenal? Do not be surprised at the painful trial. The fiery trial, another translation says, the, the word painful here is, excuse me, a Greek word that speaks of burning, like a melting furnace, where it purifies them. And I like Psalm 66 here, verse 10 says, For God tests us. You refine us like silver. It's, it's a symbolic thing that the furnace melts, it refines. That's part of God's process as believers is to make us more pure, more like himself. And how many like that? How many like to get burned? It doesn't feel so good. But it's good. If God's behind it, it is good. Think like that. First Peter 1, 6 and 7, we looked at some weeks ago, and <clears throat> it says this, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief 
and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. Your faith may be proved genuine. Let's see what you're made of. How is your faith gonna hold up when the fire comes? When the persecution comes? It may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Back up in verse 12, there's a, there's a verb here. It's, it says we're, the, the, the trials were happening, it says. These trials were happening now. They're, they're not something that did happen or going to happen. They're happening currently, and it indicates that this fiery ordeal, this trial you're going through is by God's design. It's, it's not some happen chance. It's not, wow, I wonder where that came from. God's purifying process is through fire, through trials, through stuff. It gets our attention And Peter's talking here about suffering for righteousness sake, for identifying yourself with Jesus Christ. And it's a test of our genuine faith. And if you and I are living for the Lord's sake, identifying with him, there's going to be some pushback. There's going to be. That's what he's saying here. It's going to be evident. There's going to be evidence of that in your life, expect it. And if you are not experiencing some sort of pushback, where's your faith? Is your faith active? Are people seeing it? Are you opening your mouth? Are you identifying with Christ? How are you living? Do we have the John Wesley attitude? If there's not pushback, I wonder where I'm at with the Lord. I wonder what representative I am for the Lord. There's the connection. The second way we are to look at suffering, we're to respond to suffering. Peter says, rejoice, Woo, hallelujah. Is he kind of a weirdo or what here? <laughs> is, is that our first response? No, it's not. It's, wow, this is a bummer. This is tough. What kind of weird thinking is this, Peter? I I, I narrow this rejoicing down to two ways that Peter exhorts us on how we can rejoice. What does that look like? How How does that happen? How can we rejoice in times of suffering, trials, persecutions. And the first one is when we suffer, we are sharing, we are associating, we are participating in the same way as Christ suffered. There's a connection there. We're participating, we're, we're, we're saying, I'm like Jesus Christ. I identify with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And just as Jesus was rejected, we too may be rejected for claiming righteousness, for saying there's absolutes. You know, there are two hot buttons right now in our society, two pushbacks, very significant in our society. The first one is Jesus is not the only way. That's huge right now in our society. He, he's not the only way, so quit telling me that. And the other area that there's huge pushback, and we haven't, I don't believe, even seen the start of it. And it has to do with the homosexual agenda. Two pushbacks. Therefore, when we suffer for following Christ, when we make claims for living and proclaiming righteousness, and salvation is found in where? These eight ways? 
or is in the one way. I am the truth. I am the life. Do you believe that? Can you stand on that? And when we do that, we are suffering for the same reasons. Jesus had pushback. What did they end up doing to him? His religious leaders, they put him on this cross. Participation through association. When I think about that, I think of the Pee Wee Reese and Jackie Robinson story. 1946, an African-American man being allowed to play baseball in the major leagues. Never had happened before. Never had happened. The jeering, the, sl- the racial slang, the jeers that Jackie had to undergo, threats on his life by even some of his teammates. And Pee Wee Reese, the second baseman, said, no, I'm not going to have that. I'm going to associate with him. Let's watch this clip. I think they all they want. We're just here to play ball. It's just a bunch of crackpots still fighting the Civil War. Well, hell, we'd have won that son of a gun if the corn stalks would have held out. We just ran out of ammunition. Better luck next time, Pee Wee. Ain't gonna be a next time, Jack. All we got's right here. Thank you, Jack. What are you thanking me for? I got family out there from Louisville. I need them to know. I need them to know who I am. Hey, number one! You playing ball or socializing? Playing ball, up. Playing ball. Maybe tomorrow we'll all wear 42. That way they won't tell us apart. (laughs) Can you be told apart? Can you can people say that we're the same as Jesus Christ? Are we associating with him? That's the point here. There should be no greater privilege than to be identified with Jesus Christ. Amen? Acts 5.41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin. They left the religious leaders, the group there. And it says of them that they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. (laughs) A second reason we can rejoice in suffering is we will experience a joy that is beyond our comprehension, beyond our imagination. It says, so that you may be overjoyed, it says in verse 13, when his glory is revealed. You will have more joy if you identify with Jesus Christ. More joy than you ever experienced. I ran across this story this week about a woman who, during the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, there was a Christian lady who came out with singing praises to God after the earthquake. And people were like, wow, what a crackpot. What in the world is that all about? Everybody else was crying and some were praying for the first time in their lives. Pain gets your attention, doesn't it? And someone asked her, what do you mean singing praise to God at a time like this? What is that all about? And she replied, I thank God that I have a God who is strong enough to shake this little earth. (laughs) Rejoicing, praising God, he's in control. 
If you know him as your savior, there's nothing to fear. There's rejoicing. You know, this life here is limited. It's temporary. Peter instructs that your pain, your suffering is temporary. And we can rejoice that we know Jesus Christ. Blessed are you, in Matthew 5, it says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. God notices, hey, they're standing up for me. Hey, they're walking in my shoes. For in the same way, they persecute the prophets who were before you. There's a reward in heaven, a rejoicing in heaven. The third response we should have in suffering it is, is a blessing. You're blessed. Again, a concept that's hard to grasp. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, happy. You should rejoice for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you, and if you and I have ever experienced being avoided, ridiculed, mocked, isolated, ignored, neglected, overlooked, cursed, questioned, abused, mistreated, slandered, persecuted, imprisoned, martyred because of the name of Jesus Christ, because of the suffering that comes from knowing him as your savior, you are blessed. You are fortunate to be identified with the savior. And God is with you. God's excited. God's presence is with you. That's how Stephen looked at it. Stephen was martyred. And he was given a defense for his faith and religious leaders. And here's what they saw. It says in the word. They saw his face like the face of an angel. (laughs) Wow. He counted it worthy. Peace, confidence comes from having that attitude. It's a blessing. It's a blessing we have in the Lord. The fourth response we're to have to suffering is don't self-inflict it. Don't bring it on yourself is what Peter's talking about here. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. If a person violates the law, they are subject to the penalty. That's what he's saying here. I'm not talking about suffering for not doing what's right. Or, or for, for not doing what's wrong, but for right. You deserve to suffer if you violate the law. This is not suffering for the Lord. This, this is not what I'm talking about here. He's talking about suffering for doing what's right. Standing up for what's right. Not breaking the law. The word meddler here is this this idea of being a troublemaker, being a busybody, stirring up stuff. It's a certain conduct. Don't, Don't be that way. Don't be a troublemaker at work, in the neighborhood, with your family. But share your faith. Share your faith without compromise. Some people ask me, how do I do that in my workplace? There's policies. There's balances. There's prohib- people are, were prohibited. That's, that's fine. We need to work within those boundaries. But there are ways to do that. There are ways to communicate 
We not only communicate our faith by our words, but we do it by our actions, by how we respond or not respond. We talked weeks ago about being humble, being submissive to our employers. People see that. People watch that. It gives you room to talk about. Why are you that way? How are you able to stand there and take that from that boss? And you got an opportunity. <laughs> because I'm trusting in Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. He's the one that's in control here. Don't self-inflict the suffering. First Timothy 1, 9, and 10. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who will kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders, liars, perjurers, and for what else is contrary to the sound doctrine. Don't inflict suffering doing these things. We're also... Number five, we are also to be proud to bear his name. You know, having pride is not always negative. We can have pride in a lot of things. And I believe this is one of them. We can be proud to bear his name, to be associated with Jesus Christ. However, if you suffer as a Christian, Peter goes on to say, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Are you proud to be Jesus, a believer in Jesus Christ? Are you willing to raise the flag to wear the sandwich board downtown to preach on campus? to address a, a wrong thinking? How does that come out in your life? Are you proud to be that way? Did you know that the name Christians was given to these Christ followers in a derogatory way, <laughs> a sarcastic way? They didn't bring it on themselves. They didn't choose that word for themselves. It was given to them and to the early believers because of their association with Jesus Christ. It would be the same. I'm from Nebraska. I'm a Nebraskan. That's what I'm called. Missourian. That's something that you are called, and I am proud to say I am a Nebraska corn husker. I am proud to say that I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. That's the idea here. The early believers were called saints and brothers and sisters. That's what they called each other, but they were given this name associating them with Christ, and they were proud of it. They thought it was cool, and they started to identify themselves that way. We, we do that today, don't we? Are, are you a Christian? It's a, it's a good thing. They were proud of it. spoke earlier of getting a few minutes with Doug Brown, and he's got a particular guy that he's been reaching out to, and he's this close from accepting Christ. And, and he was telling, telling Doug that in his country, you know what spoke to him the most? It, 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 it's not the gospel, the word written gospel. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. But what got his attention was the Christians who were meeting needs over here, who were touching the less fortunate, the, the poor, the, the ones that are hurt. That, that's what our our. our our people don't do that. But you Christians, I want to be like you in that. Now, what's holding him back is this guy is evidently a very intellectual type. And, and of course, we just had the Easter 
right? And D Doug's talking to him about Easter and Jesus rose from the dead. And he goes, yeah, 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 I get that. Okay, I get that. He's, the tomb's empty. I get that. How did he do it? <laughs> that, that's what he's wrestling. How, how did he do it, though? <laughs> that's like, well, okay, let's address that one. Various ways to communicate and be identified with Jesus Christ. The word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. It's said of the believers, it says the disciples at Acts 11, 26, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. They were called that. They were identified that way. Acts 26, 28, King Agrippa said to Paul sarcastically, do you think in such a short time that you're going to make me a Christian? And then here in Peter, here in Peter, we see the, the third situation. The point is that you and I should never feel ashamed to represent Jesus. We should be proud of it. Proud and thank God that he's given us, us that opportunity, that privilege. It's, it, it's kind of like the thought that we've shared before is that if you were in a court of law, and would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? What, what would they point to? What evidence would they point to when it comes to that particular situation? And so Peter said, count it a privilege. Really one of the highest privileges there is is to be associated with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And Romans 1.16, I, I really like this thought, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Do you, do you believe that? Can you, can, you, can you say that? Can you agree with that? The sixth point here, the sixth response is to accept that suffering strengthens our faith. Have you accepted that? We've talked about that numerous times. Is that in your arsenal of thinking? For it is time for judgment, it says here, 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. He's talking about the church. It's not the judgment of eternal judgment, meaning whether you go to heaven or hell, it's a judgment of refinement, making us more pure. That's what he's addressing here. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? We've seen earlier that suffering and pain refines us. It makes us more like Christ when we undergo those types of things. It strengthens our faith. It draws us closer and closer to God. Isn't that what pain does sometimes? The earthquake story. People are praying for the first time. People usually run to God. It, it makes them closer and closer. I've been tying this rope up. Anybody notice that? For a little bit. One time this was five feet long. And now we're down to a few feet. These knots represent trials in our lives. Sufferings. Look at this rope as if this was Jesus on one end and us on the other. The knots have brought us a little closer to him, haven't they? 
That's what suffering does. That's what trials do. They're to they're built into our life. God allows them to bring us closer to him. That's the idea here Peter is saying and and God uses those things in our life. He judges us, so to speak, to see how strong our faith is. And, and, and really in the sheep and goats, I'm not going to go into that whole portion, that it talks about separating the carnal Christians from the real Christians. That's what this judgment is referring to, to purge our lives, to bring us closer to God, to reveal where we're really at. Separates us from the pretenders. And it says this judgment, these trials, these sufferings are to happen right here, are to begin right here in our house. Adam and I have at times asked God to reveal sin in our camp so that we can become more pure, so that we can be a brighter light on the hill. And that has happened at times where God has revealed sin or thinking in our camp. It's been good. <laughs> it's been awesome. It's, God has found found it out and has touched it. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 6 serves kind of as an analogy to this thought to help us understand the necessity of judgment. And when God looked at the sinful people at that time, the people on earth, and to judge them, here's what he said. He said, start the judgment from my sanctuary in my house, with my people. And he says, begin it with the elders. Begin it with the leaders. God, check, check their spirit. What is their attitude? What is their life like? How, how many know me, really know me? Some of you, more than others, my wife. <laughs> I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. And yet God wants us to evaluate sometimes how we're doing. He wants to purify us, make us holy. What will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? What is their outcome. If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, you know, I barely made it into heaven in one sense. It's because of Jesus Christ. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but there are many that do not and will not accept that fact. What, what happens to them? If believers are not spared suffering, what will be the lot? What, what will happen to the unsaved? And Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, gives us an answer. He says, then they will go away to eternal punishment. That's the final straw. But they're righteous to eternal life. That's what's going to happen. That's how it's going to play out. And number seven, finish up here. What's our response to suffering is keep on keeping on. <laughs> Keep moving forward. Don't quit. Give me all you got. So then those who suffer according to God's will should not commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Three observations here real quickly. Believers' suffering is in the will of God. God allows it. It's part of his plan. It's according to God's will, it says here. And two reasons why it's happening is God is either glorifying himself through it 
or he's purifying us. That's what's happening through our suffering. We're to commit ourselves to God. Commit ourselves to the faithful creator. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. Just like I have a safe deposit box and I have some articles and some papers in there that are secure, that are protected, they're deposited in. The same is true in our spiritual realm. If we've committed ourselves, if we trust in God as our Savior, there's a deposit there guaranteed to be protected. And trust yourself into his hands. God is faithful. He can be trusted. Continue to do good. Keep pressing on. Make progress. What's the next step for you? Do not grow weary in doing good in Galatians. Finish with this verse, 2 Timothy 1.12. That is why I'm suffering as I am, Paul said. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Wow. Awesome promise. Awesome thought. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, God, for the instruction on how to live in this life and, and uh, undergo, Lord, uh, the things that come in and you allow in, Lord, to bring about pain and suffering and, and, and really growth, Lord. We thank you that you love us. That's a evidence of your love is to make us more like yourself and you allow those things. We thank you for demonstrating that. And I pray, Father, that you help us, Lord, to put into practice that which we've heard this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.